Tricky, tricky, tricker hill. If you never knew it, you never will. Bulldozers brought in for the kill. A tricky, tricky, tricker hill. This is Governor on the Clyde. The BBC and STV studios and the Science Centre stand now where tenements and the old graving docks once stood. Glass and steel structures have replaced the old tenements and docks along Govan Road, and only the Waverley Paddle Steamer is left as a solitary reminder of just how much shipping traffic used to crowd the River Clyde. New bridges have been built to replace the old ferries that once plied their trade from the south side of the city across the river to the west end. And the Finiston Crane stands as a monument to the once great shipbuilding and engineering industries that were centred at Govan, but were carried out at a host of shipyards along the Clyde. On Govan Road, only the town hall remains of the buildings that once housed a burgeoning population, with the once crowded tenements and shops almost completely gone. However, the heart of Govan is over at Govan Cross, where what started as a little hamlet by the Clyde grew into the biggest shipbuilding area in Glasgow. That heart has more or less shrunk into being a little hamlet by the Clyde again, and while it is best known for its long history of shipbuilding, Govan was there long before shipbuilding began. Initially, like many other west coast villages in the 18th century, it relied upon the weaving trade. The first silk mill in Scotland was built in Govan in 1824. It is pictured here in 1900. And while you might expect Govan's connections to the weaving trade would vanish when the shipbuilding and heavy engineering industries took over, the memory endures with the continued existence of a Govan weaver society. Govan, like that other well-known area in Glasgow, the Gorbals, is not a particularly big place, and indeed when we mention Govan, it should be remembered that it takes in the adjoining district of Linthouse, which is often forgotten. The road to Govan begins in the Kinning Park area at Paisley Road Toll. The centre of Govan is the Cross. Govan Cross has changed over the years, but around the church, 
the Pierce Institute and Breakin's Bar at Burley Street, coven ghosts would feel a familiarity with the past. Playing at shops in a muddy back court, pieces of glass for money, empty tins full of mud and stones, produce to buy. It's one and six for a can of mud and stones are ten a penny. No tick allowed in this wee shop, tap a hate me if your mammy. The innocent pleasures of times long past, whiling away the hours, playing at shops in a dirty back court, make believe was all we had. Govan's close proximity to the River Clyde would see shipbuilding and heavy engineering as natural industries to grow there. But they did not simply grow, they mushroomed into Glasgow's biggest industries and exports. The term Clyde built could just as easily have been called Govan built. Such was the intensity of industry that grew around this little village, which rapidly expanded along with the industries it embraced. Sadly, the great wealth generated by shipbuilding and engineering at its peak was not equally shared by the people of Govan itself, and the little village never became a wealthy haven on the Clyde, although the people who lived here grew to love it all the same. Like most districts close to the River Clyde and its industry, Govan was quickly and sometimes shoddily built upon to house the thousands of workers needed, and in some areas it rapidly became a slum district full of the problems slum districts brought in their wake. Despite the ready availability of work on the Clyde, living conditions in Govan remained mostly cramped, damp and crowded. Of course not all the houses in Govan were bad, but neither were they up to the standard of the comfortable mansions built by the owners of the shipbuilding yards, well away from the tenements in the heart of Govan of course. Still, Lint House to this day has the more stylish tenements that rapidly grew there. Ironically, none of the mansions built by the yard owners exist today, while many of the tenements built around the turn of the century in the heart of Govan have survived, although many more were torn down during redevelopment. Tenements in Shaw Street, Langlands Road and on Govan Road itself remain, modernised now and cleaned to show the red brick that was hidden under black dirt and soot for generations. Many other tenements have been demolished however, taking with them many shops and pubs which sat at ground level, as well as the characters who inhabited them. A lot of Govan images from the past have no modern counterpart, as the land that once housed all this life now lies empty, awaiting some kind of redevelopment. The photographs and film footage of Govan range from the 19th century through to the present day, and we include images from all eras to demonstrate how then and now can be dramatically different in one place and remarkably similar in another. Many of the Govan images are from the 1920s and 30s, and some come from the 50s and 60s through to the 1970s, when shipbuilding and engineering rapidly declined on the Clyde and Govan found itself in need of a new identity. Indeed, looking around modern Govan in the 21st century, it looks as if it's still trying to find that new identity. The Govan remembered from the late 1950s and early 60s was that of the Plaza and Lyceum cinemas, the buses and subway at Govan Cross, the Pierce Institute and Govan Town Hall, the pond in Elder Park and the busy Fairfields shipyard, where workers poured out at lunchtime and finishing time, like army ants on a deadly hunt. Many of the shops on Langlands Road, Govan Road, Crosslone Road and Burley Street had the familiar names known throughout Glasgow. Names like the City Bakeries, Peacocks, Coils, Emery and Easyfit have mostly gone now, although many of these firms still exist under new names. Only the Lyceum Cafe on Govan Road remained more or less as it might have looked way back in the 1930s, but sadly it too has now gone. What people remember about Govan of course, as in other similar areas, are the houses, the shops, the wash houses, pubs and schools, places where they spent a good deal of their day, and the characters within who might possibly highlight their routine day. 
Our journey of now and then begins at Govan Cross, the busy heart of the area then, and still the relatively busy heart of the area now. At the centre of Govan Cross is the underground station, or subway as it's known in Glasgow. From here you can travel under the River Clyde from the south side to the west end on the opposite bank, and to other destinations around Glasgow. Just beyond the subway along Govan Road stood the old Plaza Picture House, but all trace of the plaza has now vanished. Opened in 1936, it survived until the early 70s, and towards the end of its life the plaza was regarded as a bit of a flea pit, literally, but that did not stop the queues of wee boys and girls for the regular Saturday matinees. Govan had quite a few cinemas in the past, including the Lyceum, the Vogue, the Elder and the Govan Picture House. Only the Lyceum survives, but more of that later. Nearby the plaza site is Orkney Street, where the old police station stands. Orkney Street was originally called Albert Street, and the building was originally the Govan Town Hall, before becoming a police station. It is empty now and undergoing refurbishment, and the police are in a new, modern office at the top of Helen Street. Perhaps some old Govanites will fondly remember Orkney Street Police Station, but for many others it was regarded with less fondness. On Orkney Street, where the polis beat the living daylights out of me, got caught short at a quarter past three and couldn't find a lavvy. In Orkney Street, they ferried me in a black Mariah, and I was drunk to tell the truth and fought there like a tiger. Up in court on Monday morning, sporting two black eyes. The beak I swear I got them in Orkney Street, I cried. But no complaints from me, my lord. I was drunk and fighting mad. And I deserved these two black eyes. But you should see the other guys. Close to Orkney Street is the old TSB building. It too has survived demolition and is being revived. But further along Govan Road stands the fire station and one of the few old tenement buildings that has escaped the regeneration bulldozer. It is an impressive building, even in its current condition. It too lies empty, but sadly looks set for demolition rather than refurbishment, like many of its predecessors. Across the road from the tenement is St Gerard's Secondary School, another red sandstone relic from the past, now closed, as a new school takes shape nearby. Not far from St Gerard's is another well-known street in Govan. Neptune Street was originally Queen Street, where tenements and shops once abounded. Today there is little left of Neptune Street, the tenements and shops now completely gone, but that has not been the fate of every street. This is Burley Street. It leads from Govan Cross to Harmony Row. In the past, Burley Street was full of tenements and shops many of which were household names. Some remain so, like Boots and Burton's, while others like the City Bakeries have gone. Burley Street is still full of shops today, but most of the names have changed. Harmony Row itself has almost completely disappeared. The school that once stood here is gone too, but archive film from the late 1940s to early 50s reminds us that it was once a busy and vibrant area of Govan. Rock stars and footballers hailed from its streets, as well as some more infamous characters, but for the majority of people it was simply where they lived and grew up. But there is little to see nowadays. Have schools changed all that much in the half century since this film was made? Har, 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 Harmony Row. I used to go to school there, but you'd never know. Sweat to a sight without a cheerio. So cheerio, cheerio, Harmony Row. From Harmony Row we move on to Langlands Road, once one of the longest roads in Govan, which housed rows and rows of tenements and shops. It too is only a shadow of its former self, 
but some shops and tenements remain, defying the bulldozer. If we follow Langlands Road, it takes us past the Hills Trust school building. Built in 1875, from a bequest from Abraham Hill, a govan-born merchant, the building is no longer a school, but has survived to become a community resource centre. Further on stands the Salvation Army building, over 100 years old. If we follow the curve of Langlands Road, it eventually leads back to Govan Road. To the right is the Lyceum Cinema and the Pierce Institute, and to the left is the old Fairfield Shipyard. The Lyceum is one of the few remaining relics from the past still standing in Govan today. The original Lyceum was a music hall, converted to a cinema in 1923 and destroyed by fire in 1937. The new Lyceum, which most people remember, opened in 1938 and has somehow survived into the 21st century. Like many cinemas, it became a bingo hall to ensure its survival, and the shell of the building still stands today, even if its future is uncertain. Govan had five cinemas in its history. The Lyceum, the Plaza, the Vogue, the Elder and the Govan Picture House. But only the Lyceum is left, a sad reminder of how the Govan population has shrunk from the 1930s to the present day. The Vogue Cinema in Crossloan Road used to make its own newsreel films in the past. They would go around in a lorry filming the local inhabitants, mostly children, and invite them to come to the cinema and see themselves on the silver screen. A great marketing ploy. Do you see yourself in these images from the late 1940s and early 1950s? Today there are no active picture halls in Govan. Gone are the Saturday matinees where you could once get in with a gilly jar, and where usherettes with torches struggled to cope with the bedlam of hundreds of local kids, who were not satisfied sitting quietly in the stalls, but were determined to play their part within the unfolding stories on the silver screen. The films and serials on show at the matinees were usually of the B variety, but that didn't seem to matter to the young audience. Gunfighters and sheriffs and Red Indians were not confined to the celluloid, but would run around the stalls shooting everything up or scalping the nearest victim when the westerns were on. Or a hundred Tarzans and monkeys sprang up from the seats when jungle adventures were the order of the day. There were no weepies or romantic slush at the Saturday matinees, and only the ice cream woman with her tubs and lollies and Kiora drinks brought a temporary halt to the mayhem, which would continue after the lull as a war film or detective serial brought out the machine guns and grenades, not literally of course, from hidden caches within the stalls. Aye, the Saturday matinee. If you were a kid, you remember them fondly but I doubt if the usherettes did. But for busy mothers, the Saturday matinees were a boon, and the whole brood could be dispatched to the local cinema to burn off a lot of energy for a few hours. Sadly, those halcyon picture hall days are gone, and you can no longer go and shoot bandits or scalp pale faces, and you can no longer see yourself on the big screen. Home video camcorders are just not the same. She was Bella McMahon, the usherette for the Lyceum. She also did the Plaza, Vogue and Ritz. Shushing wains and watching winchers, selling tubs and chucking out drunkards, that picture's job could really be the pits. 
Sometimes if she was able, she'd stand and watch Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy, Big John Wayne as well, and dream about being in Hollywood in a clinch with the pride of American manhood up there on the silver screen instead of doing that flea pit hell. Along Govan Road from the Vogue and the Lyceum was the Govan Parish Church and the Pierce Institute. The church is over a hundred years old and the old graveyard within its grounds, while no longer in use today, holds the remains of some of the oldest inhabitants of the area. It is a peaceful oasis only yards from Govan Road where you can sit and reflect. Next to the church is the Pierce Institute, the heart of Govan in the past and still its heart today, despite many threats over the years to close it down. Built between 1902 and 1906, this archive film from the late 1940s and early 50s shows how the Pierce was at the centre of Govan community activity then, and it remains so today. All generations met at the Institute, which was named after Sir William Pierce one of the great shipbuilders from the past, whose monument, called the Black Man, sits across the street from the main entrance. The Pierce Institute offered various activities in the past, from sports and other physical exercise, to dancing for all ages, and even dominoes for the less active, and was a central meeting place for many groups and clubs in the area. A few years ago it underwent a complete refurbishment and now houses a lively cafe and theatre complex with more modern meeting and activity rooms, as well as housing various community groups. Every community needs a heart, and while the Pierce Institute is only one of many good projects in the Govan and Linthouse areas, its location in the centre of Govan and its outstanding architecture make it stand out. As it has throughout its existence, the Pierce tries to cater for everyone in the area from mothers and toddlers to the pensioners groups and everyone else in between. A range of activities was offered in the past, from netball for the young women in the area and cookery classes for both sexes. How many budding chefs went on from here to work in the catering industry, or in a top hotel, or even run their own restaurant? Today the Pierce has its own cafe, where governed people can come and relax and look at a range of exhibitions presented there. In the past you could also learn all about arts and crafts and meet a lot of young people of your own age at the Pierce. Govan, like a lot of areas in Glasgow, had its gangs, but for every one in a gang there were a dozen more who wanted to do better things with their spare time. Like today, too much attention was paid to the antisocial element amongst young people instead of supporting and encouraging the well-behaved majority, as the Pierce did then and continues to do now. Today, as in the past, the Pierce also has its own modern theatre studio, which puts on a range of productions throughout the year. Pierce in the past also offered self-defence classes in boxing and judo. Boxing was very popular in Glasgow in the past and there were boxing clubs all over the city. The city produced a few world champions and the fancy footwork learned in boxing and perhaps judo too 
could come in handy while learning probably the most popular pastime in Glasgow of the past, the dancing. Girls could come and learn Scottish country dancing, but of course the most popular dancing was ballroom dancing, and the Pierce offered classes for the budding Freds and Gingers of Govan. The Pierce had and still has a great hall for dancing. Perhaps the biggest surprise for the older generation is the slump in the popularity of ballroom dancing over the decades. At one time it seemed every young person knew how to dance, some better than others, but today, while still retaining its devotees, the dancing and dance halls of the past have almost all disappeared. Dancing was a regular feature at the Govan Town Hall in the past, but like many other things, it has gone out of fashion. He was a dancer at the Pali and he cried for Neptune Street. He'd say, allow for me to introduce myself. Her name was Alice Fallis and she said, I suppose you think you're gallus if your hero slipped back there with brocream gel. I could take you for a wolf, said he. A tango or a rumba. And later on the night, maybe I could be your lumba. You coming for a dance now or what? I suppose we might as well, she said. Although you're awfully free yourself, but you're not walking me here the night. Oh no, he cried. Because I live in Bella Houston, in a house with a back garden, and I wouldn't want the neighbours to get a fright. The Pierce Institute also offered facilities for disabled people in the past, and the blind craft classes were another feature of the range on offer. The old domino players too, of course, could find a welcome here at a time when dominoes were played in practically every pub in the Govan and Glasgow of the past. There are still domino players in leagues today, but not as prevalent as then. The Boys Brigade were another organisation that offered disciplined diversions for young people, and the BB and the Life Boys were very well attended in those days. Today the Pierce has been completely refurbished inside, but it has not changed all that dramatically. It still offers a warm welcome to local people of all ages and is one of the few remaining landmarks still standing from the Govan of the past, and which Govanites throughout the world can still recognise. Opposite the Pierce Institute, beside the Pierce statue, stands Brecon's Bar, one of the oldest and most well-known hostelries in Govan. In the past, Govan hosted many pubs, but few remain today. Only Brecon's and the old Govan Arms and Govan Road remind you of the multitude of drinking dens in the Govan of old. It was not unknown for wives to be waiting outside the shipyards on a Friday, determined to intercept their husbands and their pay packets before they hit the local pubs. Drinking and gambling broke up many a marriage in Glasgow, and Govan was certainly not immune to this social problem, still prevalent today. Close by the Pierce Institute is the new modern Govan shopping centre, and across the road from there is Water Row, so named because it housed a row of cottages that led down to the Clyde and the ferries that took you across the river to Partick. The beautiful red sandstone tenement on Water Row is pretty much all that is left of housing there now, while opposite sits Govan Old Parish Church. The churches in Govan have fared better than a lot of the housing, and have survived demolition, although their congregations have shrunk considerably from the past. While Water Row took you down to the Clyde, there is little left there on the embankment nowadays, and on the river itself there is hardly any shipping traffic compared to the past, but you can still see some unusual sights there, like seaplanes and the odd boat or two. Opposite the embankment at Water Row sits the site of the new Museum of Transport, currently under construction in 2010. 
The River Clyde itself, of course, was the lifeblood of Old Govan. For over a century, shipbuilding and engineering dominated the area with a range of yards all along the river. Today, of course, while ships are still built in Govan at the old Fairfield Yard, the Clyde's heyday has long passed. The story of shipbuilding on the Clyde is a story all of its own, but the prosperity from that now almost forgotten industry was not invested in Govan itself. While pockets of Govan are relatively affluent, the area was and is considered a deprived community, even in the days when work was plentiful. Govan is no better or worse than other deprived communities in Glasgow, and while a lot of the bad housing has been removed, and areas like the Moor Park Estate, known infamously as Wine Alley, have been eradicated, there is precious little new housing or industry to drag Govan up from its current depressed state. Ironically, Moor Park was a grand 19th century mansion house in Govan, but you did not find any grand mansions in the Wine Alley. But its people have always been tough and determined, and continue the struggle to renew and rejuvenate their ancient borough. From the days during the First World War when Govan activists, led by the famous Mary Barber, helped organise the rent strikes, local people have always rallied against exploitation and injustice. Perhaps it needs another Mary Barber to rally Govanites in the 21st century, to lift the area above its depressed condition. His name was Johnny Don and he was the broker at the pond. They brought him all their rings and things to pledge. Suits and banjos, pearls and raincoats, trumpets playing only blue notes, fair population living on the edge. His shop was down a lane, but people always looked ashamed that they had to go to him to get some cash. But times were hard and money short. Paydays were a long way off. While many of the tenements were pulled down in Govan, particularly around the town hall area, others were considered good enough to be saved. The tenements at Howitt Street and Lewith Street, just before the old Fairfield Yard and off Govan Road, are classic red sandstone buildings that have survived. Further along Govan Road to the west of Water Row is the old Fairfield Yard. It was here in the 1950s in particular People remember the thousands of workers pouring out from the main gates to catch buses or trams or propelling themselves on bikes. These are the images that people remember most of Govan. Shipbuilding meant work and work meant relative prosperity. That message has not changed. Opposite the shipbuilding yard is Elder Park, a green oasis amidst an industrial desert. John Elder was another shipyard owner, whose wife Isabella took over the running of the company when he died in 1869, and gifted the park and the library, as well as a cottage hospital, to the people of Govan. Elder Park's greenery and boating pond were a welcome relief to the people of Govan in the past, more used to dark tenements and grim back courts, which they were glad to escape from. Beyond and around Elder Park is Lint House. Some of the tenements, townhouses and villas in Lint House suggest a slightly more affluent area than Govan itself, particularly around the area of St Kenneth Drive, where the school stands. Lint House has hardly changed over the years. Streets like Boroughhead Drive and Cressy Street retain their tenements, and unlike Govan, Lint House seems to have escaped the wholesale demolition that was so prevalent in many communities in the Glasgow of the past. Of course, appearances can be deceptive. Beyond Lint House is the Southern General Hospital, which marks the boundary of the Govan and Lint House areas. Four or five wains it was, rarely anything less, sharing a bundle of blankets in the bed recess. But that was the way it was back then. That was the way we lived. Single ends in one apartments, wains to feed and dress. To the east of Govan Cross, along Govan Road, you head towards Govan Town Hall. Just before the Town Hall itself, hidden amongst the undergrowth, you can find what is left of the old graving docks. Still remarkably well preserved, 
You can just picture the ghosts of old ships sitting in the docks, waiting to be overhauled or repaired. Close by is Govan Town Hall. This wonderful red sandstone building was completed in 1899 and opened in 1901, and has survived, although it sits rather forlornly nowadays, the tenements that once surrounded it having been flattened long ago. With the modern buildings of the BBC and STV studios nearby and the Science Centre, it looks uncomfortably out of place beside these modern glass structures, and yet, in the distant past, it too was the centre of much activity within the Govan community. But that community has shrunk now and moved away, and while the town hall is still used, it is now a pale shadow of its former self. Perhaps new housing will spring up beside it with a new community who will help to restore it to its former glory. Govan still maintains its community spirit, however, with the continuation of the Govan Fair. And while the old Govan Press is no longer printed, there is still an active community working to revitalise the area. Mama used to take her washing up to the Harhill Street baths in the days before the washing machines washed and spinned and dried. Filling up the pram with sheets and shirts and soaps, the smell of smelly underpants fit to gear a book. In the days of social washing where women could go and talk. Then progress came and washed them away and something there got lost. From the Town Hall we are back to where we started, at the BBC Studios and Science Centre by the Clyde. The Waverley sits at her moorings, and in the distance is Glasgow City Centre, beyond the new bridges and the crane on the Clyde. I can remember Govan in the 1960s, when it was, to me, bustling and busy at all times, but nowadays it seems like a pale shadow of its former self. Perhaps the creation of the new television studios and science centre are just the vanguard of new development and settlement in Govan that will take many years to complete. Major shipbuilding, it seems, is gone forever and new industries will have to be found to replace it and provide the jobs and opportunities to help local people advance. The local people in Govan, like people in Glasgow in general, will work hard to revitalise their own community and perhaps in years to come, a new govern will rise like a phoenix from the ashes, and once again it will become a centre of major industry. The govern that I and most people remember is gone. Only time will tell if a new govern emerges to play its part in the development of Glasgow as a major centre for industry and commerce. They used to run dugs and they used to race cars along the tracks of the White City. Now the dugs are all dead, and the cars are wrote off, and there's no mere White City. Now the big police office sits on the land where the bookies once dominate it, and the White City ghosts continue to run, but now, well, nobody's interested. <laughs> 